So my title was originally advertised as TBA. <laughs> so I, I decided to stick with that. Kind of like it. And in my case, it means teaching by audience. And I'm going to talk to you about teaching. The T in my TBA. Um, I really just want to introduce some topics for discussion in the area of teaching as it affects and is affected by digital humanities. Um, I'll start by offering a general observation that arises from my experience using digital humanities methods in teaching, sometimes in teaching classes that weren't digital humanities classes, and that'll actually be my first example, um, and using digital humanities methods in teaching digital humanities classes. And the observation is that students work differently when they have a real audience. It's quite palpable, actually, and uh, uh, evident in the quality of their work. Uh, and in my experience, even grad students uh, often have relatively little experience writing for a real audience, um, though digital humanities, I think, is helping to change that in various ways. Um, the use of social media in digital humanities is rampant. Um, and it opens channels of communication and I think kind of eases the way into more formal kinds of uh, communication with audiences. Um, open digital content, social media, uh, <coughs> digital humanities tools that are presented as web services, uh, all of these offer some great opportunities for students to connect with real audiences. And uh, this is a, an important and I think often overlooked benefit of teaching online or designing assignments so that student work will be presented online, FERPA be damned. Um, so FERPA will probably uh, dictate that you should offer students the option um, to work in private. And all of the things that I'm going to show you as potential tools have pretty much have some way to do that except this first one which I built before FERPA. Um, but most things offer you the option. Um, and it is probably actually a good idea. So this is a class uh, that I taught. I've taught over many years, starting at the University of Virginia. I've taught it at the University of Illinois. It's been taught to uh, undergraduates as early as the second year. It's been taught to doctoral students. Um, it's a class on, it's really on bibliography. No one will take a class on bibliography. So this is my stealth bibliography class. <laughs> and in my stealth bibliography class on bestsellers, students learn a lot about the publishing industry. They learn about all the permutations that books as objects go through because, of course, bestsellers are bibliographically hyperactive. They have sequels, prequels, many editions, performances in other media, translations, etc. So they're great objects of study. Um, for me, it was a digital humanities class because when I started this, I wanted to learn how to write PHP to work with databases on the web, so I needed something to do. Um, but I was the only one for which this was a digital humanities class. Um, the class. Um, so this is this is all it is. It's a very straightforward um, thing that results. Students fill out forms. Uh, they don't have to have any particular technical expertise. They just cut and paste information. Um, it's what this course does, though, is really drive students through the library and through lots of different uh, research resources and reference resources. And the other thing that it does is gives them ownership of a particular piece of original research, and that's another thing that I wanted to emphasize. When students pick a title off th this list, which is based on the top 10 annual fiction bestsellers from each year in the 20th century, no one can pick that title again, assuming that they complete the semester successfully. If they don't, I recycle the title. So they own that title, they own the research on that <coughs> title. They realize pretty quickly they're doing original research because uh, the answers are not canned anywhere. They can't get them at their frat. Um, and I mean, it is pretty plagiarism proof if you, you know, if you actually design a course around original research. It makes it a little hard to grade, but it's worth it. So that's an example of working in the open. I've had students corresponding with people who are interested in their title during the course of the semester. I've had students who kept working on their title after they got their grade and left uh, because they were so wrapped up in the assignment. I've had students become special collections librarians on account of this class, so it has a profound effect on people when they do original research, when they own that research, and when they do it for real audience. So uh, some of the most important lessons in digital humanities have to do with learning how to uh, elicit 
tacit knowledge from a collaborator or uh, from textual sources. Uh, that's about listening to and understanding an audience, and that's a core digital humanities skill. So earlier when Trevor was talking about markup and saying it's not a mechanistic exercise that in order to mark a document up you have to um, come to terms with what you think that document is. That process of coming to terms is a process of recognizing the tacit knowledge that you have about documents and expressing it in some explicit way. Um, and so helping people do that uh, is one of the things that you do in digital humanities centers. Um, I have a brief example from the doctoral level here. A student of mine uh, at the University of Illinois, Bayou, who's now a faculty member at Syracuse, did work uh, on text mining with me. And one of the things that she did on the way to producing this article, uh, which was published in Literary and Linguistic Computing, uh, was to look at the literature in uh, Project Muse and compare it to literature in knowledge discovery journals, KDD journals, text mining journals, to see whether the humanities scholars were using terminology that suggested that they were doing activities that could be mapped to text mining operations. In other words, are they thinking in terms of categories, classifications, and other things that text mining can actually help you with? So as a sort of inferential approach to discovering how text mining might be useful in the humanities. And she discovered um, much to her surprise, that actually uh, they were doing quite a bit of it. She said, I examined the use of data mining keywords in the critical literature like model, pattern, association, correlation, etc. I'm surprised to find that literary scholars used as many models, patterns, and associations, if not more than computer scientists. So it looks to me like literary scholars are doing data mining things, except the basic elements are changed from numbers or symbols to humanistic elements like character, identity, language, social phenomenon, etc. Um, so that was, that was a form of eliciting uh, from the literature in this case some tacit knowledge about what people were doing. They don't think of themselves as doing data mining, um, but in fact uh, we were able to determine that there are some things that data mining could do that would be useful to them. Um, tools offer interesting teaching opportunities themselves, not only uh, in using them in the class to build things, uh, which has its own virtues, but also just as objects of study. Why are they made the way they are? Uh, why do they have the features that they have or the limitations that they have? What insight do they give us into sort of evolving idioms of software uh, from the desktop software to web services and so on? Um, and uh, what, you know, what do we learn along the way? So I did an exercise uh, with a class that I taught last semester at Brandeis in which I wanted students to do markup, just a little bit. Um, at Brandeis we have uh, the manuscript for Catch-22. Uh, there's a six page chapter in there. Uh, it was a small class. I gave one page to each student and we, we did a, one class on, on TEI markup. Um, I, I asked them to mark up one page. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Not a lot to worry about. And then we came into class and compared their markup they used Oxygen, uh, an XML editor that we site license at Brandeis and that's available uh, quite cheaply uh, for educational users. And they used TEI Boilerplate, uh, which is a great way to, especially with a class, to get around the problem of I don't have time to also teach them XSL or extensible style sheet language. TEI Boilerplate uh, is some pre-cooked style sheets that you can use with TEI to produce um, things like this, which is, was the ultimate result of that class exercise, this is the six page chapter about General Scheisskopf. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, you know, we had the page images and the, and the markup that they did on the page images. Um, and there were interesting little things along the way they did, that they had to d discuss. On this first page, for example, There's a number up there at the top, 684. What does that mean? Is that part of the manuscript? Should that be marked up as part of the text? Is that in the hand of the person who wrote the manuscript or is it someone else's annotation on the page? Um, you know, how to deal with insertions and deletions, uh, how to mark up proper names, whether to mark up proper names, why would we bother marking up proper names? All those kinds of things are available in, in an exercise like this.
Um, parallel texts are an interesting teaching opportunity as well. And parallel texts are, are much more, uh, they're much easier to produce now than they were a few years ago with off-the-shelf <coughs> tools uh, that operate as web services. Um, this is <laughs> a parallel text edition or a, a parallel browsing presentation from before it was easy to do this. Um, this is John Bryant's edition of the manuscript of Taipei in what he calls a fluid text edition. And it's published with Rotunda, which is the University of Virginia Press imprint for digital um, editions. And it allows you to compare, in this case, the, the manuscript in the upper frame uh, to the first edition in the lower frame and to see what changed between the two. So that's an, that's an I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious how that could be interesting in a class to see the process of revision, to try to understand what's happening as the thing changes state on the way to publication or after publication. And something like this makes it easy to see that with a particular text. Um, there is now a, a tool that was mentioned earlier called um, Juxta, which is uh, recently released in a, in a web service version. So you can set up an account online. You can upload your, your texts, your witnesses, um, and you can visualize them in various ways. And you can even, it even incorporates a, a beta version of uh, the, something called the versioning machine as a, as a web service, which will allow you to output uh, a TEI edition of your um, synoptic text when you're finished. This example is an example of something else that Juxta does that makes it extremely easy to use for a teaching purpose, and that is it allows you to load up different states of Wikipedia entries and compare those things. So these are, in the bottom windows here, these are two different uh, instances of the entry on digital humanities in Wikipedia. Uh, one is from August 9, 2013 on the left. One is from April 4th, 2012. The middle column here shows you all the things that have changed between these two states of that entry. And if you were teaching somebody about digital humanities, one of the and, and you wanted to find a more interesting way to approach the definitional question um, than to say, well, some people say it's this and some people say it's that. This would be a very concrete way of, of looking at how that definition actually evolves in you know, what by now I think we all agree is probably the definitive reference work on things like this out there in the world. So an interesting exercise with some off the shelf tools. Um, text mining. Uh, Understanding statistics is increasingly important for certain kinds of digital humanities work, and we're going to have to grapple with that in our teaching. Um, Ted Underwood's blog has been mentioned before. I think it's called The Stone in the Shell. I highly recommend it, especially if you're trying to figure out how to talk to uh, students about some of these issues or how to understand them yourself. Um, Ted writes about statistical issues in extremely understandable um, language without uh, dumbing it down. And uh, it, his blog is, I think, maybe the single best teaching source for, for that uh, kind of material when your audience is humanist. There are good off-the-shelf uh, off tools that you can use here as well, Voyant. Uh, is a tool produced by Stefan Sinclair and Jeff Rockwell. Again, recently uh, available as a web service, so you can create an account. You don't have to download and install software. You can upload texts that you want to compare. You can just cut and paste URLs. If you go to Project Gutenberg and you want you know, three different editions of something, just you know, plug in the URLs and then punch the load button, and you'll get something like this. Um, this has a lot of different uh, panels that have different tools in them. I'm not going to walk you through what they all are, but just for example, in teaching, you look for opportunities when you're working with tools like this to teach basic concepts for the tool. So I just turned off stop words in the visualization. And by turning off stop words, what we get is the most frequent words uh, with, with no filter. And the most frequent words are, in many cases, the least interesting, um, which is why we use stop word lists. 
Now, stop word lists are sometimes counterproductive in literary uh, applications. So we found, for example, in some of the work that Bayou was doing with me and others in the, in the um, Monk project, that when you were analyzing poetry and trying to find uh, erotic passages in the work of Emily Dickinson, uh, those stop words turned out to be surprisingly important, really made a measurable difference in the ability of software to detect those things. And the same thing would be true if you were trying to uh, use these kinds of tools for uh, something like authorship attribution where the little words matter a lot. But for a lot of purposes, stop words are good and, and there's a very easy way to show somebody why stop words matter. And there are good examples out there. There's a nice gallery on the Voyant documentation of things that people have done with it. Um, this is a doctoral uh, student at the uh, University of Essex in the UK who's got a database of works about post-apocalyptic cities and who uses Voyant as one of the tools for exploring that database that he's built, and here is writing a blog post about the usefulness of Voyant in doing that kind of exploration. So again, for teaching purposes, you can point people not only to the tools, but also to the work products of people who've used them in research that looks like the work that those students might be doing. Uh, mentioned Omeka earlier. Omeka is also uh, available as a web service, meaning uh, you, you can download it and install the software, the whole stack, the LAMP stack, that is a web server and whatnot, a database, and Omeka on top of that, but you don't have to. Uh, you can go to omeka.net, you can sign up for an account, and you can do an online exhibition. There are limitations. It won't let you upload hours of video or things like that. There are ways around those. You can upload it to Vimeo or YouTube and embed the link. But, um, it's easy to create exhibitions with this, and it's easy to uh, use it in your class. There are, in fact, on the Omeka site, um, a recent blog entry on suggesting particular ways you could use this in your class for teaching purposes, with lots of examples. Uh, this is one that Ryan Cordell did when he was at St. Norbert's College with a bunch of undergraduates. This is just one class project. There were many class projects in this class where students used Omeka to do an exhibit on the history of buildings on their campus, which, uh, according to Ryan, they found surprisingly interesting. <laughs> a neat line, I don't think has been mentioned. Uh, this comes out of the Scholars Lab at the University of Virginia. All of these things, with the exception of oxygen, are academically produced, the things that I've showed you. Um, Scholars Lab uh, produces Neatline. Neatline is now a plugin for Omeka, so another thing on that stack. Um, but Neatline is also something that you can use in a limited way with an online account, just in the same way that you can with Omeka. So you can create Neatline exhibits in a, in a basic way. Uh, you lack some functionality that you will find attractive. You can't, uh, for example, this is an, an exhibition done not by students, but um, that incorporates historic maps. The ability to insert that kind of layer depends on your actually uh, installing GeoServer, which is not available in the sandbox version. Um, but there are hosting options, which I'll show you in a minute, which make it pretty cheap to actually just have somebody install the whole stack for you and let you come and use it on an ISP. So um, this is, Neatline is a nice way to begin uh, working with maps and working with some of the core concepts of GIS, like layers, um, and to, to also talk to students about when you, when you contextualize things like this, what's the difference between the sort of core artifact or object and ancillary things that are important to provide context but maybe shouldn't be in the same bucket with the archival object. So for example, when you saw this um, paste in, uh, in layers, you saw the layers come in, you saw the arrows first, and then the historical map came in sort of underneath the arrows. The historical map is an Omeka object in the sense of uh, it has permanent existence outside of this exhibition. The arrows and lines are just for this. They're, they're just for this context. And you wouldn't want to bundle them with the archival object. So you know the fact that they're treated separately allows you to talk about certain kinds of concepts with students and think about you know what's the difference, what's the sort of difference in ontological status between the lines and arrows and the historical map, and why is that so? And if you were doing that, you might actually read the documentation for the software as, as a way of opening up these questions. 
Um, this is their documentation of the neat line records. Um, it gives you a data model. This is a great way to introduce the idea of a data model. What's a data model? Well, it just tells you what, you know, for this thing, what, what are its parts. A neat line record has a data model that includes a title, a body, coverage, presenter, various other things, and you can talk about, you know, how did that data model arise? Why is it that way? Um, and then this is particularly useful also because what this, this bit says is originally there was no difference between Omeka records and Neatline records until we stumbled on the problem that I was just describing before, which is that not everything really should be permanently in Omeka, and some things are just part of the Neatline exhibit. So then they had to invent different language and different data models for Neatline record versus an Omeka item. I mentioned hosting. This is, this is a commercial service. Um, I'm not paid by them or plugging them. It's just that they're the only one I'm aware of who offers you, uh, you know, sort of plug and play installation of this out of the box if you just wanted to experiment with it for a little while and see if it was actually going to be useful. Sometimes with stuff like this, it's a lot of work to get the thing set up in the first place only to find out that it doesn't really do what you want it to do. So it might be worth $25 to find that out. Um, so if this is what uh, teaching digital humanities looks like in the present, what's the future look like? Because this whole thing was supposed to be a, about the future, right? Um, I think one of the things that will change is we'll have gradually uh, access to larger collections and more robust tools. I'm part of a group that's um, organizing a research center around the Hathi Trust materials. The Hathi Trust materials are the materials digitized out of academic research libraries in the Google Books project. It's billions of pages, um, and, and we're now setting up an infrastructure that would allow people to work with much larger uh, document sets and work sets than you can in the tools that we've been looking at, many of which have a limit of you know, 10 texts or 15 texts, because it just takes a while to compute this stuff. It's actually pretty computationally intensive. So I think we'll see um, more sort of industrial scale tools like this. Um, we'll also see, I, as I said before, I think you know more of various kinds of mathematics creeping back into the humanities education, but also a really uh, more diverse set of interests, methods, and backgrounds. Uh, the Digital Humanities 2013 conference was uh, a very diverse group of presenters uh, in age, race, gender, uh, very diverse set of topics and approaches. Um, it's really encouraging to see uh, how that landscape is, is opening up. Um, there are some great readings to open up those questions with students. One that's worked very well for me is this uh, piece in Debates in Digital Humanities by Tara McPherson called Why Are the Digital Humanities So White? Um, and one of my graduate students who did this reading last semester afterwards said, yeah, I never really thought that it meant much to say that we had like a master drive and a slave drive. But you know, suddenly I think, Hmm, maybe that language means something. Maybe that comes from somewhere. And I think maybe even uh, we'll see a future-oriented humanities. It's a sort of a gag in the TEI community that our unofficial motto for the text encoding initiative is yesterday's information tomorrow. Um, and you know, that's a lot of what the humanities is about, actually, is yesterday's information tomorrow. Well, Carrie's book, which is coming out from MIT Press soon, called Hopeful Monsters, is about uh, what a future-oriented humanities would look like. And I think it's incredibly important work. Um, I recommend it to your attention, uh, opening up the landscape uh, to the future as a, as a topic that the humanities could actually approach and deal with. So thank you very much. We're almost right on time. Um, great, thanks.